Hello everyone and welcome back to Solar System Colonization. This is post-commentary on the missions that were conducted during the live stream on November 15th. Just a reminder, this is all in the Realism Overhaul set of mods for Kerbal Space Program, so we're operating on Earth in the real solar system. The full mod list is in the video description. The first mission I decided to tackle was a simple one, putting a long-range satellite into orbit. So far we've done relatively short-range satellites with dishes that could communicate between Earth and the Moon. Here I used the longest range dish that I had available, capable of communicating to Pluto and beyond. Uh, I think it's a 25 billion kilometer range. And so you see here the fully fully formed satellite with all the fuel that needs to get to geostationary, no, geosynchronous uh, altitudes. So about a 23 hour and 56 minute orbit. And uh, we've got various antennae and solar panels and stuff on there. Plenty of fuel. No problems, and this will be launching on a Falcon 9. So, uh, pretty straightforward mission to start off with. Wanted to get started on something that uh, wouldn't be too complicated as people filed in. Don't want people to miss too much. Okay, so here we go. The nine Merlin engines lit. And launch. We note some overheating in the fairing there. Uh, not too sure what that was about even now. I don't know what was overheating. Uh, certainly nothing in the fairing should be overheating, especially at this early stage. Possibly some parts that were clipping together, but the overheating indicators did fade away eventually. As you can see here, uh, with the rocket past 2 kilometers, now passing the speed of sound. Uh, no apparent problems in the launch here. So this ended up being an 8 hour stream, which was quite, quite lengthy. Uh, and so we'll have a, a few launches here as we see that the overheating markers do reappear as we get beyond 20 kilometers and again I, I don't know what it was but my, my best guess would be some sort of part clipping causing the overheating. Anyway here we are at first stage separation and I did reserve the fuel to make a mock recovery of that core stage. This satellite is not at the capacity of Falcon 9. This is still a very light satellite. Seems to be like there's three markers there, so something, something to better. Three of? I don't know. I, I don't think there's anything that this place with three-way symmetry. Maybe it was four, but I'm not sure what's up with that. Anyway, uh, the satellite survived despite those little markers. Everything seems to be intact. Now I want to make the point that the amount I reserve would be for a Falcon 9, but for a Falcon Heavy, it's a little bit more complicated because the core stage ends up being carried much higher and much faster. I don't actually know how much to reserve in that case. And I actually made a mistake on that uh, during the stream, and I'll point that out again later on. Anyway, uh, here we have separation of the second stage. We are, uh, well, we're basically in orbit, but uh, we need a little bit more of a boost to get our periapsis beyond 130 kilometers. 130 kilometers is the border of atmosphere in realism overhaul. So, and in real solar system actually. So I boosted up uh, actually all the way to an apoapsis of 35,786 kilometers, which is geosynchronous orbit. And then we'll head on out to that uh, altitude and then circularize is the plan. Okay, so uh, a little bit past the mark that I was aiming for. And we're not gonna be exact about this, as long as the orbital period is about right uh, at 23 hours and 56 minutes, then it'll be okay. And there's no particular reason to be precise about this satellite. It's a long-range satellite and we've got plenty of ground stations for it to communicate with, not to mention other other satellites in orbit. And it's got many, many antennae to make sure that I can communicate with all of them. So here we go, and so a little bit of RCS burn in order to get the orbital period just where we want it. In a moment you'll see me open up the main dish and tune it to active vessel. That has its benefits and drawbacks. If you are in a situation where you need to bounce the signal off of another satellite uh, because you're like on the opposite side of the planet or something, this will not help because it's trying to uh, connect with your craft instead of the relay satellite. And in that case you need to tune it to the planet that you're around. Next up was another request from a viewer, and that was to make an orange slash pumpkin system, which was the system in my colonization series uh, around the stock system, you know, uh, the YouTube series, uh, where I used this to land uh, modules on the moon. 
And this is, of course, more co complicated in Realism Overhaul because we're talking about landing stuff on the real moon, which takes a lot more delta V. For the Kerbin system moon, I'd say that I'd plan about 1600 meters per second or something like that to land something on the moon and then get the sky crane back into orbit. Uh, for the real moon, I plan about 4,800 or more. And so that's what we're dealing with here. The orange portion, the actual body of the craft, contains the fuel to land the payload. In this case, I'm planning for a payload of 10 tons. So that's its capacity. And then the fuel on the pods with the engines, these are Estes engines. So the fuel in those little uh, tanks there, that's the fuel for the sky crane to get back into orbit. At the prompting of viewers, I decide to do something that I don't normally do, which is test the craft. Uh, you should know by now that I don't do tests normally, but uh, in this case I decide that it might be wise before we send it all the way out to the moon, which is a many hour long endeavor. So I make sure that the fuel flow is right, uh, that we didn't need to run fuel lines from the body, from the orange out to the Estes engines, and we didn't. Uh, fuel crossfeed was fine. Then I hacked gravity and saw whether there was some imbalance or some rotational issue with the craft. And so that need, uh, it does have a reaction wheel, by the way. Uh, but this is realism overhaul, so the reaction wheel is very weak. So here we go, we've got hack gravity on, and I'll, I'll keep the label for as long as that is true. I very rarely use hack gravity, and uh, even when testing stuff. So, a novel experience for me. But there, there you see, the, the outboard tanks on the engines are actually locked right now. So this is just a delta V in the orange section. And uh, of course, uh, even though it's reading 4,000 meters per second right now, uh, if it had the 10 ton payload attached to it, uh, it would have much less LTV. We'd be looking for about 2,600 meters per second to safely land a payload on the moon. If we had to be accurate about where the payload needed to land, I'd probably want even more than that. And so the amount of payload we could carry with this would be less. But you can see that the orange is handling fairly well. It's not a pumpkin because the pumpkin has a creepy smile made out of solar panels on the side. Uh, this does have good lighting, as we'll see in a little bit, but uh, this is the orange realism overhaul style. And you can see the small docking port at the bottom there. That's a propellant only docking port if I recall. Uh, so it's not meant to transfer kerbals or anything because obviously there's no reason to have a docking port that can transfer kerbals. Here I'm pushing, I'm deliberately pushing it to see where uh, control is lost. Now we have hacked gravity but there's still an atmosphere. So we can lose control like this. Uh, obviously in a complete vacuum it wouldn't be a total loss of control. Here uh, with the atmosphere there it does flip around but I ultimately get it back to the mark and so it stabilizes with some RCS help and of course the gimbling of the engines which you can see very pronounced here as we were testing it in the nighttime that's why we're in night vision here but in order to see how the lighting worked I decided to turn night vision off and turn on the lights and that's how it looks with the lights on and uh, not too bad actually not too bad at all so there you have it the orange but now we have to send it all the way out to the moon um, now that we verify that it works, so that is what happens next. We send it on the, uh, to the moon, and of course unhack gravity, very important. Uh, we send it to the moon on SLS, and this is SLS block 1, I think this is block 1C. I created a 1C. Um, the 1C means that instead of 4 RL10s on the second stage, I put 1J2, which was a configuration that NASA thought of and was considering before they decided to just go with the RL10 version. So here we go, and of course the video is sped up four times, uh, which is the maximum I can do right now, and uh, of course that's to compensate for the fact of physics lag and all, frame rate lag and all that. So off we go. It should be noted that I didn't change the second stage tanks at all, except for the fuel mixture when putting the J2 on. I didn't resize the tanks to take advantage of the J2's extra thrust. And so we actually end up on balance with less delta V and less carrying capacity than the SLS Block 1B. The main reason for putting the J2 is simply time. The RL10s take 18 minutes and 45 seconds to burn and that's even more tortuous because of the physics lag, so you, you're talking about an hour to burn, basically. 
And uh, as we get ready for a booster separation here, I think. There we go. Yeah, I, uh, I decided that for the sake of the streams... Ooh, and fairing separation is really tight here, but uh, we made it. But uh, yeah, for the sake of the streams, I wanted the higher thrust engine so that we can get the burn done quicker. And that's why I went with the J2. There's no, there's no payload benefit to it. It's simply a matter of time. So anyway, we're getting ready for separation and the start of the J2 here. Okay, engines out. Set. And there's the J2. It is just the J2. I didn't have a J2X configuration. That'll be in after a little bit, thanks to Aaronim. Aaronim's been doing uh, configurations for me. Uh, he watches the stream and has been contributing by adding new configurations to these things uh, to match real life. And of course, NASA was planning to use the J2X, not an original J2 on the SLS. They wouldn't have thought of using the J2, not when a better version was available. Anyway, uh, here we have a targeting of the moon. We do have Ullage rockets to settle the J2 down. And there we go, the J2 is relit. Uh, exactly how it was with the Apollo missions. So uh, again, a single J2 completed orbit and then did translunar injection, exactly how it did with the Saturn V. So, still a long burn, but not quite as long as the RL-10s. Here I've extended the little engines on the orange, and so that's working out fine. You never know, sometimes uh, in the fairings, maybe all the jostling and G-forces, the little hinges be go awry. Here we go, we've got our... Okay, we've got a track to the moon. I decide not to adjust it using the second stage there, because that would uh, be too cumbersome, it's very heavy. So I just used a fuel on the orange to take care of that, and now the orange is going to have to get itself into orbit around the moon. Here I'm just fine-tuning the approach and making sure that we get close. I'll have to remember, of course, that any payload that is going to make use of the orange to get to the lunar surface is going to have to match that orbit, so that's a consideration. Here we're entering lunar SOI. Considering that the Orange is making lunar orbit insertion with its own fuel, that means that its first payload had better be less than 10 tons, otherwise we won't actually have enough fuel to carry it down. So we'll have to carry down a smaller payload for the initial test of this system. We won't do that here, I, I didn't do that in this episode. But we'll take care of it at some other time, possibly in the coming, coming uh, cast, in the coming stream. Anyway, you can see with the engines lit, it uh, really rocks those hinges a bit. But uh, otherwise, uh, no, no clear problems. Everything seems to be under control. Obviously with a cumbersome payload, that might be different. If the payload is at all asymmetrical, that could be a problem. The Planetary Base Inc. modules come to mind as we see that orbit is reached and I leave it with a somewhat high apoapsis and turn to the aforementioned planetary base ink modules in this ISRU test. Now we had some trouble controlling this on the first attempt to get it on the moon and so I do another test. Uh, the first thing I want to do is make sure that the uh, modified configurations to the engines worked and so uh, we have that there and the uh, next thing to worry about is fuel flow because, and here I've, uh, I decided to go with hack gravity again, since that works so well with the orange, and uh, we had a little bit of fuel flow problem and the balance problem with, the, with this whole module when it went to the moon. Here I take off and remember there is atmosphere here, and you can see it's listing to one side unaccountably. That's sort of the situation that we had at the moon. And it's, it's hard to reckon how that could possibly be reasonable. I mean, it's, it's symmetrical around, certainly around that axis. Uh, the roll axis should not be one that it's unbalanced around. And so I've got this little problem. And it, it sort of hangs around there. Uh, the RCS can bring it back to program. You can see I've got it back to the program marker, but it can't totally write it. So I head back to the VAB, and uh, the first suggestion was to just 
uh, put identical tanks all over. Now there's no way the ISRU can run like this because there's no tank for ore. But basically we filled it with uh, MMH and N204 tanks, all identical, and then uh, let it rip again. So here we go. And off it goes. And with a full set of identical tanks, it still does the whole list to the left. And same direction note. It's not a controller problem, obviously, because I use the same controller when launching the orange. Now, uh, here I decide to flip around that portion. On the off ch uh, because the fuel flow seemed to be going asymmetrically, and I figured if I f flip that around like that, then it would restore symmetry to the fuel flow. I have no idea why the fuel flow is going asymmetrically. But so now this is a configuration that ha should have symmetric fuel flow. And we still got high gravity on. Okay, well, initially looks promising. There's still a tilt though. Yeah, it's still listing to the left, same direction. Seems a bit better. But we are also sort of controlling from a different point, so it's difficult to compare. Sort of different, difficult to compare. But at least uh, the fuel flow seems symmetrical. So I guess that's a plus. Though it didn't seem to be the problem that we were trying to solve. Anyway, double checked all that. And again, this configuration it would be useless. It can't drill for ore like this. There's no ore tank. So, the next thing is to flip the engines. And so that's what I did next on the chance that maybe the engines had some sort of asymmetry uh, which is weird but uh, just in case I flipped one of the engines around and then launched launch there we go and here there is some wiggliness but one thing I did was I turned RCS on immediately. You'll know RCS was on right from the start. And so RCS is compensating somewhat. It still seems to want to go awry. But it didn't, it didn't get a chance to do it initially and because of the RCS. And I think that probably kept it in line. That's not going to help us if there's a real imbalance here. So I don't know. This looks a lot better. But seems a bit dodgy if there's a real problem. So I'll have to contemplate this. It's possible that the way we deliver ISRU to the moon might be using the orange instead of this this module here which has its own power. Okay, well on that note, well let's let's undo hack gravity please. Yeah, unhack gravity. And now let's proceed with our other missions. So I'm going to leave this ISRU test thing for another day and the next thing we need is some way to store fuel around the moon. And we need that to refuel the orange. We need it so that when the ISRU stuff gets going we can store the fuel that it produces. And so here is a tank that has three portions. The top portion is a hydrogen tank. The center, uh, interestingly textured portion, it contains MMH and N204 for the orange. In particular, it has the right size tank for that. And the bottom portion has liquid methane and liquid oxygen. And so those will be all resources that we hope to drill using extraterrestrial sources, meaning off of the Earth. And so, yeah, I'm launching this on a Falcon Heavy. And uh, there we go. It fits right into the fairing there, just barely. Now you might have noticed uh, earlier there that I took the fuel lines off of the booster, the side boosters, and that means that they're no longer cross-feeding into the center. And that's because people in a previous episode told me that with uh, smaller payloads we shouldn't be doing that cross-feeding. One thing I forgot though was to create an engine group for the core, uh, the core's engines, the center nine engines, uh, so that I could throttle those down. If I can't throw those down, then all three portions are going to be using fuel at the same rate and want to separate at the same time, which is not optimal. And I discovered this partway into the launch, and so uh, you'll eventually see me 
pointing this out to people and then I have to I have to quickly try and feed fuel into the center which was the recommendation. There are other ways of handling it. For instance, I could have shut off some engines on the core, but I decided that feeding fuel into the center was probably the best way to do it just so that we could keep up our uh, our TWR. So here you see me pointing out that I didn't have engine groups uh, uh, what you call it, uh, set up, which you can do in Realism Overhaul, That's uh, so you can throttle a certain set of engines differently from another set of engines, that's an integrated function into Realism Overhaul. Here I'm trying to figure out how to select the tanks so that I can uh, redistribute the fuel, but then eventually I get the fuel re redistributed, and you can see that the boosters are running out of fuel faster than the center. And here we're getting ready for, for the separation of side boosters. There we go, they're out and off. Alright, now uh, you'll remember earlier on I told you that I made a mistake regarding how much fuel needs to be reserved with, in this situation, if I want to recover this stage, this core stage here. And I actually don't know how much is necessary. So there you saw me reserving about 1200 meters per second that's probably wrong. Probably that's not what we need to reserve unless you can land it on some sort of island or if you launch out of Brownsville, Texas, if you can land at Cape Canaveral, then that might be enough. If you're going to try and land the core stage back at Cape Canaveral, then that's not enough. If you got a barge way out over the Atlantic, maybe that'd be enough. So on it goes with the second stage and uh, because of my little failure there, um, we, we didn't get quite as far using the second stage as I would normally like, but as it turns out that meant that the second stage would re-enter, which is positive. I still haven't fixed the plume there, I really need to get down to that because people do complain. That plume I guess is fitting something that shapes, uh, that has the same shape as the LV-909 rather than this engine. Anyway, because we fell a little bit short, we have to use the payloads engine to boost us a little bit more. And uh, those are Super Dracos, so those are the engines on the Dragon 2. I'm actually going to use them for translunar injection, which is a little bit novel, but um, it works. They're the best engines for it. I could have used the SS engine, which I've been using for quite a, quite a lot in, during this series, but then I wouldn't be able to put the docking port at the bottom there. And so I decided I wanted the docking port at the bottom, and so I used the radial engines instead. And these are by far the best MH and N204 burning radial engines. Okay, so it's on its way to the moon with that, and that's the trajectory after an RCS correction. Oh, sorry, RCS correction is still underway, as I think I'm trying to get close to the orange, though it's not necessary to get exactly right with the orange because the orange is going to have to land something on the surface of the moon and then return to orbit before it needs the services of this this craft. Now this craft, uh, until we get ISRU going on the moon, well even after we get ISRU uh, going on the moon, this craft will not be able to refuel anything using MMHN and 204 unless it gets those resources back from Earth. And that's because no ISRU configuration that I have uh, allows you to drill for MMH and N204 because I don't know about what would contain nitrogen especially on the moon so I assume that we can't create MMH and N204 we can create methane, oxygen, hydrogen, water basically so yeah this will have to be refueled from earth it's just gonna store the stuff uh, but it can contain hydrogen and oxygen and methane so that's positive Anyway, I go about uh, with a station resupply mission. I wanted to get some more supplies to our Earth orbit station, Skynest. And I start off building my own little probe, but then people uh, recommended that I use Dragon. And so the Dragon capsule that resupplies the International Space Station. Uh, that's a little bit... Uh, a little bit less efficient because the Dragon Capsule itself is very heavy because it's meant to return stuff back to Earth as well. And so it alone is already 4 tons and then uh, that leaves me about uh, enough space to shove 4 tons of food, water and oxygen in there, which I do. 
and uh, then we have the trunk and of course Falcon 9. The other drawback of the Dragon, I didn't realize how horrible this would be, is that it only has 400 Newton thrusters. That's 0.4 kilonewton thrusters on it. And so that's going to cause a bit of a problem, as I'll soon discuss. But here it is, uh, Dragon Capsule on a Falcon 9, as we've seen before. Unfortunately, because we're going to the station, we have to launch at night. It's that time of year. A uh, different time of year, we will be launching in daytime in order to rendezvous with the station, but right now we're launching at night. And here we go. Engine split. And launch. And thus began what was ultimately about a two hour ordeal. Because when you have only 400 Newton thrusters to make a rendezvous, either you plan things very well, or, if you're like me while I'm live streaming or playing the game in general, uh, you have to use a lot of fuel and take a lot of time. And so that's what I ended up with. And actually, even if you did plan everything excellently, it would end up taking a lot of time just to match speeds with the station and getting to alignment with the station and then finally docking. Because it just takes a long time to speed up and slow down using 400 Newton thrusters. Anyway, here we go. I used all of the first stage here, and so I did not reserve fuel for uh, recovery of that, and that was because, uh, first of all, I was getting a little bit tired. I was already six hours into the stream, and so I wanted some extra margin to work with, and also my numbers, I thought, I felt were a little bit tight, so I decided to uh, go ahead and use that fuel. I think it's because I really loaded up the Dragon Capsule, it's carrying as much as it can. So, I, I wouldn't say I overburdened it, but I certainly filled it up. Anyway, so we get into, uh, well, tight on one side orbit, and then I start making the correction to uh, rendezvous with the station. You can see our closest approach distance after that burn with the second stage, which you can relight, was about 60-odd uh, kilometers between 60 and 70, and then I separate off that second stage. I regretted that eventually, and then extend the solar panels here. Yeah, I probably should have just retained the second stage, which has 10 ignitions, and done the rendezvous with that, even though that's not what you do with a Dragon Capsule, because that would have been quicker. And this is a live stream, and uh, in retrospect, uh, using 400 Newton thrusters to do your rendezvous when you're doing a live stream is not the same as doing it in real life. In real life, it's a great idea. In, uh, in, uh, in entertainment, it is not. But anyway, I cut out all of the pain and suffering for, for you guys. Uh, this, was a total of, uh, this mission took a total of two hours. And uh, there is the station. You can see how slow uh, the process of uh, matching speeds is, and actually we overshoot, uh, we do not actually meet up with the station on that rendezvous, we end up about 50 kilometers off, and we have to do a further corrections in order to get close again. Now you can't just burn, you can't just aim at the station and burn towards it, and try and burn off that velocity, uh, you will run out of fuel like that. We do have a limited amount of fuel, and the RCS system here is is overburdened as it is. But anyway, here we go. We're uh, we're relatively closer now, and I can start making the rendezvous very carefully, trying not to use too much fuel. You can see uh, if you look at the MMHN N2O there, and uh, uh, nitrogen tetroxide. Uh, there's not much. There's not much at all. As a result, I decide to turn the station towards the approaching capsule very carefully. This took a while too. Um, we, we didn't uh, swing it around like crazy, but uh, slowly brought it around so the docking port was facing the approaching capsule. You note know that we have the Dragon version 2 on the other end. That thing probably won't survive re-entry, but uh, I, we're certainly not going to carry any Kerbals down in it. We will probably bring it down at some point. But uh, here, the Dragon capsule floating towards dock. And this will basically double the amount of supplies on the station. So it's quite a boost. Here we go. And I'm very careful about it. Because there is no docking port magnetism or anything like that, you gotta be careful. And final phase there. Just a meter away now. 
These are the NASA docking systems, so there's not propellant only. Probably two meters away at that point. Now we're less than a meter. Okay, come on. All right, finally. Okay, good. Anyway, so that's what happened on November 15th during the live stream. And so our plans are proceeding, though we really need to get some interplanetary missions underway. And I hope to do that next time. So with that, I'll say thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below. And I'll see you next time.